We will dispense of the routine announcements this morning so that we have more time to worship. As a reminder, silence your phones, enjoy coffee hour. If this is your first time here, it is on us today. And at noon, join Betty for the Sunday Lunch Bunch at Desert Pines Golf Club, where we will meet to help solve the world's problems. Members and guests are welcome. See Betty Lacombe for more information. Today's talk is a continuation of Nina's service on March 19th. Carrie, Marin, Margaret, and Mark will be talking about our perspective on the proposed changes. None of us shared what the other will be saying, and the order of the talks was determined by lot. So open your minds and hearts to learning something new about the Article 2 Commission and maybe a little about the UU movement, its relationship with UUCLV, and possibly yourself. Let's start with the ringing of the worship bell and the lighting of the chalice. Forgot who number two was. <laughs> um, we gather together, we light the chalice, a symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. The chalice reminds us that we are connected to a much larger tradition that stretches out of the past, reaches around the world, and leans into our shared future. And join with me. We light the chalice as a reminder that together we are a beacon in the desert. May its light lead the way to love, acceptance, and justice as we strive for personal and societal transformation. Now please rise, embody your spirit, and sing our opening hymn, Peace Like a River, number 100 in the gray hymnal. But we will only be singing the first, third, and last verses. For ease, the words will appear up on the screen. Number 100, Peace Like a River. Thank you. 
taken the language of the Article 2 study report and pared it down. All the language is the same, there's just less of it. I've done my best to give an accurate representation, but more concisely, of the Study Commission's report. We will have printed versions for those who would like to read it for themselves and come to their own understanding. First, the charge to the Commission by the UUA Board of Trustees. The Article II Commission is hereby charged to review Article II of the UUA bylaws and to propose any revisions that will enable our UUA, our member congregations, and our covenanted communities to be a relevant and powerful force for spiritual and moral growth, healing, and justice. Proposed changes should articulate core UU theological values. The board believes that one core theological value shared widely among UUs is love. The principles and purposes you will prepare should be a living document that challenges Unitarian Universalists to place the liberation in all its dimensions of all at the center of our lives. They should be honest about our past, name what we are facing and our aspirations, and where we hope to be, not just for today, but looking out at the horizons. They should ask us to choose love in action as a path forward. We therefore charge this commission to root its work in love as a principal guide in its work, attending particularly to the ways that we and our root traditions have understood and articulated love and how we have acted out of love. The commission is charged with reviewing all sections of Article 2 and is free to revise, replace, or restructure them as needed to meet the objectives stated above. There is nothing sacred about the number of principles or sources nor their specific wordings, nor in any way that Article 2 is laid out. We encourage creativity. The board would like to see an Article 2 that is inspirational, memorable, and poetic. The welcoming, the language should be inclusive and welcoming and explicitly anti-racist. The commission is urged to carefully consider the existing language for its implications and for the errors or inadequacies of those implications. We particularly urge the Commission to review the sources, the revised listing from the 2010 proposal and its ex explicit inclusion of Unitarianism and Universalism as our sources seems timely to us. In addition, there have been energetic discussions about how other faith traditions, such as Buddhism and Islam, among others, might be included or put on footings more equal to those of Christianity and Judaism. Second. The responsive resolution given to the Commission at GA 2021. We ask the Article 2 Commission and the Board to ensure proposed changes to Article 2 include in the principles a clear and direct statement that accountable systemic anti-racist and anti-oppressive actions to build beloved community are part of what it means to be Unitarian Universalist. And finally, the process and timeline of the commission so far and the future of the proposal. The Article II Study Commission convened in the fall of 2020. At General Assembly 2021, the commissioners produced the, Ar the Article II study process in a general session and engaged attendees in focus, focus groups. Draft language was prepared and shared during general sessions at the 2022 General Assembly. Focus groups and surveys were used to collect feedback on those drafts. Over the course of its work, the Commission engaged with 45 feedback sessions with 4,611 total participants. Their videos reached 
7,765 viewers, and their 29 surveys generated a total of 10,925 responses. Congregations are encouraged to have conversations to gather input from their members to inform their GA delegates. There will be opportunities for delegates to recommend amendments to the proposal, including at a mini assembly at General Assembly 2023. The board will also be able to recommend amendments. The final version of Article 2, as amended by the Board of Trustees and or the 2023 General Assembly, must receive a simple majority vote to move forward to a final vote at the 2024 General Assembly. It will take a two-thirds majority vote at the 2024 General Assembly to be adopted as the new Article 2 of the UUA bylaws. If either vote fails, a similar proposal cannot be considered for two years. Each of our four speakers today will talk about what they think of the proposed changes to Article 2, none coordinated or shared the content of their, of their talks. But first, let's have uh, Jim Burstman share why his contribution for why I love UUCLD. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jim Burstman. Um, I did public speaking for years, and I got accustomed to the jitters that would come before I got up to talk, knowing that if I had 15 minutes, I'd get into my groove. I don't have 15 minutes. So you're gonna to have to basically uh, ride with what I'm, what I'm offering. Um, long, long story short, Mary Jane and I were members of the congregation back east, UU congregation for 21 years. Moved here in 2013 and looked for this church and there was, happened to be a Henderson, we live in Henderson, the Henderson Gathering. And we got connected with the church through that group. Um, really friendly, welcoming, thoughtful group of people. So what has kept me going with UUism? Uh, I'm just thinking how timely this is, that what I liked about it, still like about it, is it is bottom up rather than top down. One of my concerns about the Article II Commission is it's kind of top down. Um, however, in the meantime, what the reasons why I keep uh, coming to the church, why I keep contributing. Number one, uh, to provide fair, equitable salaries, wages for everybody that works here. Uh, we tend to shoot really pretty low in our budgets. They're always bare bones and inevitably we come up short every time there's a pledge drive. And I know some people who have said um, they, they give a certain amount in the first round because they know there's gonna be a second round. Uh, so <laughs> we give what we can, in fact, we give a little bit more than we can in the first round because we really wanna see things succeed. Um, and that could include uh, doing more than just repairing the bare minimum of things that are broken in the building um improving the building but i think it also has something to do with giving to the community which is what really hooks me my my most of my work career was involved in doing things broadly to improve people's lives in whatever community i was interacting with so when i came here um i got this idea for the food pantry and i was met with some support some skepticism, you know, the people in this community are not gonna take food from us, are you kidding me? Or you're not gonna enough people to uh, actually come to the food pantry. It was a kind of a long cumbersome process. I was encouraged to make the application. If you wanna do the application, go ahead and do it. Uh, so it took a few months. Um, and on the Thursday before we had our first distribution, I organized an orientation for anybody that wanted to participate. 30 people showed up blew my mind. I mean, it was just absolutely wonderful. Um, and when the truck pulled up the first delivery, um, <laughs> I was ecstatic. I couldn't believe this is actually happening. So we're coming up on our fourth anniversary of the food pantry in April. Um, and every month, there are usually at least 20 people that show up to help out. It's not always the same people. So it's been a rotating cast the characters and, and many people here have, have participated in food pantry. That's just like one element. I think I, I constantly am coming up with ideas. Uh, some of them fly, some of them are met with 
dead silence. <laughs> Others are met with skepticism and, and a pushback. And I think I, I've gotten a little less inclined to work so hard to push something. If people don't want it, then we'll move on. So examples of things that have worked, the, the free medical clinic from Toro University, I thought that would be a real winning proposition. And we really didn't get much support. I mean, people from the community didn't tend to come here for that. Um, but we did do two drive-through flu shot clinics and a COVID clinic here, COVID vaccine clinic. Um, voter registration, get out to vote. Uh, some of this is about going out and doing things that feel really uncomfortable. I really did not want to knock on doors in the neighborhood and see if people knew about the election coming up. We weren't promoting any particular candidate. It was just letting people know about making sure they got registered. Um, we had some great conversations with people. It was awkward as hell to go knock on doors and people open the door and look at us like, what are you doing here? Um, but it was really reaffirming to do that. Through the food pantry, we've had uh, voter registration. We've given out information about SNAP benefits, which by the way, you probably know, are all getting cut severely. Um, if you're thinking about where your money could go, we get most of the, of the food that we distribute comes to us free through Three Square. But I have a feeling there's gonna be a much bigger need. And so we could, there is a bit of money in the budget to get buy food each month, supplemental food, but we could be doing more. I mean, we could, we could be doing a distribution twice a month. It's a lot of work to do that. Or we could be doing other things in the community. So those are the things I think about why I continue, that I think that together we're more effective than if it's just one of us working on something. And there's lots of, a lot of people here do uh, giving back to the community in other places besides here. Um, so Nevada's for the common good, for instance. Um, a lot of good was accomplished through uh, what we did, and we, we would show up in pretty big numbers at candidate accountability nights where there were 600 people coming from around Clark County to have questions posed to them by NCG staff. 40 people from here showed up one time um, in, a, in a crowd of 600, and we're comparing ourselves against other member institutions where there's sometimes 7,000 people. So we were, we were pretty notable for that. And those are the things that we can do, that we can show up. Um, I like one of the things that I heard uh, Bruce Turner say a few years ago when he's kind of talking to the pledge drive. He said that he gives money to keep the place open for the people who haven't arrived yet. Going back to the, to the, just the, I'll finish up in a second here. As far as money for the food pantry, this area, the, the neighborhood of our church, has the second highest rate of food insecurity in all of Clark County. So it's not like it's for nothing. And yes, there are some people who drive through in cars that look like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I can't afford a car like you're driving. But we don't question because the people show up and they register and they pass through, give them the food. Um, homelessness, that's another issue. I mean, we have homeless people who I'm not sure if everybody in the back is gone now, but we have people living back there, people who are across the street have been, I, I guess, evicted from that vacant lot, and now they're out on, on the wash trail. Anyway, um, my, my values are together, we can do more together, and we can, we can be more effective in the community if we work on it together. So, amen. <laughs> The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Las Vegas is situated on the traditional homelands of the Nuwuvi Southern Paiute people. We are grateful for the land itself, for those who have stewarded it for generations, and for the opportunity to worship, learn, work, grow, and be in community with this land and her peoples. We encourage everyone present here to engage in continued learning about the indigenous peoples who work and live on this land since time immemorial, including the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe 
and the Moab Land Pirates and about the historical and present realities of colonialism. It is as important to recognize and appreciate the use of Southern Paiute land as part of our mission to be a welcoming and inclusive place for worship, spiritual enrichment, and exploration within the community. Here is some suggested learning. Thacker Pass near Reno was the site of an 1865 massacre of Paiutes committed by the US military. Last month, after a year of protests, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony filed a suit to stop progress on the Thacker Pass lithium mine. Also, Nevada has at least two Native American leaders. Considering learning about the history of one of them, Sarah Win uh, Winnemucca, a Paiute woman from Northern Nevada, we wish we will be reading chapters of her autobiography and having monthly discussions from March to June. In today's order of service, uh, supposed to be a page that contains our current Article 2 and our current UCLD Covenant of Right Relations. Um, we have a little scan thing up there. Uh, on the other side of the paper are the proposed words of the revised Article 2. The picture designed is also included. The four of us will now take turns reading those words. These are the words proposed by the Article 2 Commission. Section C 2.1 Purposes Purposes The Unitarian Universalist Association will devote its resources to and use its organizational powers for religious, educational, and humanitarian purposes. Its primary purposes are to assist congregations in their vital ministries, support and train leaders, both lay and professional, to foster lifelong faith formation, to heal historic injustices, and to advance our Unitarian Universalist values in the world. The purpose of the Unitarian Universalist Association is to actively engage its members in the transformation of the world through liber liberating love. Section 2.2, .2, Values and Covenant. As Unitarian Universalists, we covenant congregation to congregation and through our association to support and assist one another in our ministries. We draw from our heritages of freedom, reason, hope, and courage, building on the foundation of love. Love is the power that holds us together and is at the center of our shared values. We are accountable to one another for doing the work of living our shared values through the spiritual discipline of love. Inseparable from one another, those shared values are interdependence. We honor the interdependent web of all existence. We covenant to cherish earth and all beings by creating and nurturing relationships of care and respect. With humility and reverence, we acknowledge our place in the great web of life and we work to repair harm and damaged relationships. Pluralism. We celebrate that we are all sacred beings, diverse in culture, experience, and theology. We covenant to learn from one another in our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace our differences and commonalities with love, curiosity, and respect. Justice. We work to be a diverse, multicultural, beloved community where all thrive. We covenant to dismantle racism and all forms of systemic oppression. We support the use of inclusive democratic processes to make decisions. Transformation. We adapt to the changing world. We covenant to collectively transform and grow spiritually and ethically. Openness to change is a fundamental of our Unitarian Universalist heritage, never complete and never perfect. Generosity. We cultivate a spirit of gratitude and hope. We covenant to freely and compassionately share our faith, presence, and resources. Our generosity connects us to one another in relationships of interdependence and mutuality. 
equity. We declare that every person has the right to flourish with inherent dignity and worthiness. We covenant to use our time, wisdom, attention, and money to build and sustain fully accessible and inclusive communities. Section 2.3, Inspirations. As Unitarian Universalists, we use and are inspired by sacred and secular understandings that help us to live into our values. We respect the histories, contexts, and cultures in which they were created and are currently practiced. These sources ground us and sustain us in ordinary, difficult, and joyous times. Grateful for the religious ancestries we inherit and the diversity which enriches our faith, we are called to ever deepen and expand our wisdom. Section 2.4, Inclusion. Systems of power, privilege, and oppression have traditionally created barriers for persons and groups with particular identities, ages, abilities, and histories. We pledge to replace such barriers with ever widening circles of solidarity and mutual respect. We strive to be an association of congregations that truly welcome all persons who share our values. We commit to being an association of congregations that empowers and enhances everyone's participation, especially those with historically marginalized identities. And finally, Section 2.5, Freedom of Belief. Congregational freedom and the individual's right of conscience are central to our Unitarian Universalist heritage. Congregations may establish statements of purpose, covenants, and bonds of union so long as they do not require that members adhere to a particular creed. So I get to have the first say. My name is Marin Osteen, and I am a fourth generation Unitarian. While I think this is a potentially huge change for UUism. On the surface, it is not the biggest change my family has stuck around for. But in some ways, this potential change feels like the death of the Unitarian part of Unitarian Universalism. This also feels like the board of the UUA thought that the eighth principle would not pass a vote. So instead of trying to improve the eighth principle wording or doing work, as a religious institution, we are instead trying to avoid the issue by a wholesale abandonment of half of the foundation of our faith. When looking at the proposed changes to Article 2, I think it is important to examine the board of the UUA's charge to the commission. That charge stated that love should be centered. I do not agree. Centering love feels like we have decided to abandon Unitarianism and change to just Universalism. Additionally, many horrible atrocities have been done over the years by people and organizations, including religions, that at least felt they centered on love. It is also not something unique to UUism. People should be able to read Article 2 and decide if they want to check out a UU congregation. An image with love at the center, surrounded by six vague concepts, does little to distinguish us from other religions, like Baha'i and unity. Love is also not an objective concept. A quick search of Merriam-Webster generated 24 meanings of love. The proposed purposes section does include a sentence that I think is intended to narrow down, the meaning of love. It says, quote, the purpose of the UUA is to actively engage its members in the transformation of the world through liberating love, end quote. When I hear the phrase liberating love, I think of growing up in the deep south and Southern Baptist going on mission trips to liberate those poor people who just don't know about the transformative power of Jesus. In other words, I hate the phrase. <laughs> it triggers memories of years of being bullied by my classmates for being UU and how in not converting to being a Southern Baptist, 
I must want to spend eternity burning in hell. I encourage everyone to be critical and to remember that it is in fact a big deal to change the foundation of our religion. This is distinctly different than, for example, adding a new principle. This proposed change has the potential to completely transform Unitarian Universalism. Change can be good and productive, but change can also be incredibly destructive. It is our responsibility to arm our representatives to the General Assemblies happening both this year and next year with the most information possible so they can properly represent us when voting for UUCLV. We must decide if this change would be productive or destructive to the greater UU religion. While I am of the opinion that this change would be destructive, my singular opinion is not what really matters. Please be as engaged in the process we will be going through leading up to the General Assembly as you are able. And do not forget your interpretation as people that already attend a UU congregation of the proposed Article 2 is not the only interpretation that matters. Article 2 and our principles and purposes or our values represent us to everyone else. Love and the six values that surround it will be used as a shorthand for what all you use believe. The values will become the central part of most you use elevator pitch when explaining their faith. They will be what children surrounded by people who do not like them have to rely upon when they explain why they will not be joining up with the Southern Baptists. Reflect and consider if you feel the proposed Article 2 is a strong enough foundation for us all. I have to chuckle. <laughs> what a great lead. We did not plan this at all. I'm Mark. I've been a lifelong UU. And this was one of the toughest writing I have done in a while. I debated. Should I point out how many times a certain word appears in our principles, sources, and covenant? Should I have a debate about the difference of a covenant, a dogma, a creed, or a chalice? No. What I landed on was to tell you about the process I used to find peace with this proposal. But let me back up a little bit and talk about that elevator speech to give you some context. A number of years ago, I was asked by some very devout Mormons what is UUism? It was not my best day. <laughs> my stomach hurt, and I was not as eloquent as I would be tell them today. My answer at the time embarrassed me because I could not remember those darn seven principles. <laughs> but I did mention that we live by seven principles, and one of them is that everybody has worth and all are loved, and we use those principles to do good work. We do not have dogma or creeds, or like other religions. From that day on, I worked on crafting my 15 second talk, answering what Unitarian Universalism is. It has a similar theme, but is more based on our principles and sources. When I first saw Article 2, that report from the commission, my jaw dropped probably like everybody else here. Where were the stakes that held this religion together? my beloved sources and principles. How are we supposed to have values based on simple words? But as I sat, I walked, I biked, and went about my daily living, I pondered what those words meant. I realized that if I had to choose six or a dozen words to describe UUism, I would probably end up pretty close to those seven words proposed. I would wager, like I do, not because I'm in Las Vegas, but because I enjoy the challenge, that if each of you wrote down the 12 single words that describe Unitarian Universalism, you too would come up with very similar words to the seven that are proposed. They may not be the exact words, but I think they will be pretty darn close. I did this exercise and found out that I matched one word exactly, got one word almost on the spot, and the other five were included in the words that I wrote down. Sometime in the near future, during a quiet part of your day, give it a try. 
and see what you come up with. What I like about this proposal is that it's easy and brief. Let me give you an example in another way, an example in the way of another challenge. I would like each of you to do three things without looking at the hymnal or looking at our walls and without raising your hand or speaking up. Keep the answers to yourself. How many of you can remember verbatim our eight principles? How many can articulate the six sources? And how many can speak the words of our UUCLV covenant? I will confess, I can only do one of those. I can articulate the six sources. I can get three or four principles and almost none of our covenant. Is that right? How can I express what it means to be a UU without doing that? The seven words are easy and serve as a frame to hang the work we do in making this a beloved community. The next thing I did was to consider what the words mean. I tried them on. If you have not done so, I would suggest using the reflection words of UU Lent. Contemplate what those words mean to you. After spending some time with the words and their descriptions, I have found peace. In fact, I have found them to even be more expressive of my faith than the eight principles and six sources and our covenant of right relations. And the true beauty of these words is that I can remember them and use them to articulate my faith to those I meet on the street in a more meaningful way than memorizing the principles, sources, and covenant. In that consideration, I discovered something deep about those words. Each of them can be used for a ministry. Now listen to this. A UU ministry of equity, a UU ministry of justice, a UU ministry of interdependence, a UU ministry of plurality, a UU ministry of transformation, and most of all, a UU ministry of love. I don't think I missed any of the six words or seven words. And while those specific words and presentations and minutia might stick in your craw, take some time to ponder the words and see if you can find peace with them. Try the exercises I did. Consider the ministry for you that you do for this church so we can do good things and get into good trouble with these seven words. We will now ground ourselves in the present and honor those with whom we will share this time. I invite you to settle into your seat Feel the chair holding your body. Imagine the earth holding you. Take in a comfortable breath and exhale. Let the joy and the despair and the frustration and the satisfaction of the week trickle off your shoulders. Let it collect in your hands. Set them down, not ignored or abandoned. They will join you on the rest of your journey today but let them rest. Allow yourself to be present in this space. Please find a way to acknowledge those with whom we share this time together. You might smile or place a hand over your heart or give a small wink. I invite you now to return to the larger circle. If you have someone you would like held up please add their name to the chat. Uh, today, we hold up Dave, Veter, and the Peck family. Irma, do we have any names in the chat? Seems no. May we hold all those displaced or alone and all those names spoken here and those held in the silence of our hearts in love and compassion. This uh, pastoral reflection is called To Outgrow the Past by William Lawrence Sullivan, and I'm going to admit that I got picked to do it because I'm the oldest of us four. <laughs> you know, I, I, the, the Beatles song applies to me when you're six, when I'm 64. <laughs> to outgrow the past, but not extinguish it. To be progressive, but not raw. Free, but not mad. Critical but not sterile, expectant, but not deluded. To be scientific, 
but not to live on formulas that cut us off from both life, from life, to hear it miss clamor the pure, deep tones of the spirit, to seek the wisdom that liberates and a loyalty that conquers, consecrates, to turn both prosperity and adversity into servants of character, to master circumstances by the power of principle, and to conquer death by the splendor of loving trust, this is to attain peace. This is to pass from drear servitude to divine adoption. This is to invest the lowliest life with magnificence and to prepare it for coronation. Now, please join our song leaders as we sing our pastoral hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, number 188 in the gray hymnal. We will sing the verse three times. The words will be on the screen. Number 188, come, come, whoever you are. been part of three UU churches in my four and a half years of knowing this religious tradition. In all of them, I have preferred roles where I make real the visions of other people. You likely have seen me participating in services as the song leader or the worship associate. But for this topic, the spirit compels me to speak. I have many more thoughts than fit here. Please, I encourage you to come talk to me after the service. This is an important conversation to have. There are many small issues I have with the proposal. Seemingly innocuous wording changes, generally poor communication, devaluation of the democratic process, overly broad terms that are ripe for misunderstanding and confusion. Things I could get over with, with enough time and whinging and amendments. But I have little time, so I will just talk about my two big fundamental issues. The proposal replaces the principles with the less clear, less helpful values. In the words of the commission, seven single word values, each with a short sentence of explanation, are easier to remember and use as touchstones in our conversations, in congregational governance, and in educational settings. The desire to make our principles more accessible by making them easier to remember is, well, it's fine, I guess. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with that desire, but I don't really see who it's supposed to help. It's not going to help newcomers. Boiling everything down to seven individual nouns certainly doesn't make it clear what we believe. In fact, it makes our beliefs extremely obscured, requiring lots of further unpacking and explanation a needless barrier placed in front of those who might be curious or want to join the community. It's not going to help long time you use either. Seven nouns with one or two short sentences is a pretty thin foundation for a religion. It seems more appropriate for a week long retreat where you spend like a whole day <laughs> on each of the sources, excuse me, each of the values. But when I think about my lifelong spiritual journey, I know I would hunger for more. In making our principles easier to remember, they've been stripped of much of what is worth remembering. The wording of the current principles contains some deliciously juicy contradictions. They are fertile ground for deep thought and personal growth. 
In our third principle, we are challenged both to accept others as they are and to encourage spiritual growth. In our second principle, we are tasked with having both justice and compassion in our relations. In our fourth principle, we are both free and responsible. We are being asked to give up much more than we are getting with this new framing. But let me move on to the other big change I want to point out. The proposal replaces the sources with nothing. Well, as good as nothing. The proposed inspirations are sacred and secular understandings that help us to live into our values. In the words of the commission, if people feel an official list is necessary, we would suggest a process that includes theologians, ministers, religious educators, musicians, artists, writers, and lay people. It's a cop-out and it's deeply disappointing. There is so much opportunity for growth if you want to discuss changes to the sources. Taking out the sources is the cheap, easy move. To be clear, I think the sources deserve an overhaul. The singling out of Jewish and Christian teachings and earth-centered traditions as somehow separate from the religions of the world is odd to me, especially since we aren't listening to these traditions. For all they have to teach us, we are explicitly cherry-picking what we want out of them. There is work to be done on the sources. Abandoning them is not the answer. But this proposed change is a disservice not just to the religion as a whole, but to every single person coming into it. It needlessly deepens the, deepens the divide between two already existing populations of people. The in-group, who knows what sources we actually draw from in practice, who are already knowledgeable of the, of the specific traditions that are important to this congregation or that one, and the out-group who doesn't know any of that, who would now have no indication what they might expect to be shared from the pulpit. It's also uniquely unhelpful for people coming to UUism from a background that is very religiously monocultural. I'd say I'm luckier than that. I grew up in walking distance of my parents' Catholic church, a mosque, and at least three synagogues, but I still had a huge blind spot. Seeing humanist teachings put on the same level as the theistic religions I'd been surrounded by was a totally new idea. Hiding the specific sources behind the vague language of understandings that help us makes revealing those blind spots much more difficult. Another unnecessary barrier to spiritual growth. To sum up, I don't like the proposal that the Article II Commission has presented. I resent what they have removed and I am unimpressed by what they've put in. I'm also left with the disappointing feeling that this commission's work has only squandered this opportunity to bring long awaited changes to the bylaws. We absolutely should consider what parts of our bylaws are working for us and what parts should be changed. But for me, this is a gift I cannot accept. So, I need a favor from two of you uh, to go get the plates and get ready to pass them around because I don't want to have an assigned to the usher today. Thank you. Oh, we've got more than one volunteer. Thanks. We gather as a religious community to give each one of us a place where we can do the work of many. The offering supports the mission of the congregation to be a beacon of love and justice in the desert and supports local organizations working to make our community a better place for all. The offering this month is shared with the minister's discretionary fund. The link to donate your offering will be in the chat on Zoom and there are boxes at the back. There are boxes at the back of our set. Well, no, there's plates going around have to change that and uh, where, where you can donate. And now please join with me. 
With gratitude for the abundance in our own lives, we give for the life of this congregation and for the benefit of the larger community. And we thank you for your gifts of time. So my turn. I'm Carrie Poole, and I've been a UU since 2005, after following a convoluted religious path through Catholicism, Judaism, and Wicca. And I've been to many UU congregations over the years, because I moved a lot in those 15, these last however many years it is, 18, I guess. So my title is Some Thoughts on the Flower, because the flower is this new symbol we're working with. I first found out about the proposed changes to Article 2 at the beginning of the year. My initial reaction was not a positive one. I felt like the rug was being pulled out from under me, especially because I'm one of those use, you use for whom the principles are a statement of belief. But I challenged myself to find something that I actually liked about the proposed Article 2. What I found was the image of six values centered on a core value of love. It appealed to me because love is one of my core spiritual values. I'm a theist. Uh, I am a heretical Christian, so I value the words of Jesus, but I also value the words of John Lennon and all you need is love. <laughs> It also appealed to me because I'm particularly drawn to the numerology of six, seven, and six surrounding one. It's, you could see my, uh, I wear a flower of life. It's a symbol of interlocking circles with a core of six. At the time I decided this, I was looking at the image from the fall draft, which I have heard referred to as the blobs. Six ovals with one word values surrounding a single oval with the word love in it. It had that simple drawn on the back of an envelope feel, and I was sure that there would be more to come. Sure enough, a few days later, the official draft was released with the current version of this image, which will take the place of the principles and sources in the new article too. It is referred to this flower, because it looks like one. Six petals, each a different color and containing a different word, swirling around a central image of the word love superimposed over a flaming chalice. Using a symbol instead of a series of statements as an expression of belief can be powerful. It may be a cliche, but a picture can be worth a thousand words. The problem with using a symbol is that it's more open to personal interpretation than a series of statements. For example, when I look at the symbol of the flaming chalice, I understand it to be a symbol of Unitarian Universalism. But I also see a symbolic representation of the joining of the masculine and feminine. This works for me because I'm a Wiccan, and that's a central thing in at least some forms of Wicca. And I would be curious what you see when you look at that flaming chalice. So while Article 2, Section C22 includes a detailed description of what the symbol is supposed to mean, the truth is that it needs to stand on its own. If the flower is to be our new statement of belief, it needs to readily express what it means to be a UU in a way that works for the majority of us. For me, in its present form, it does not meet that test. I really like the central image. Love is the core of what we believe, of our actions and aspirations, resonates strongly for me. Moving out to the values of the six petals is where I have some issues. Three of the values really work for me, and I have no problem with using them as defining values of our faith. The other three are nice, but I'm not sure if I agree with them as defining values. The three that resonate strongly for me are generosity, 
transformation and interdependence. One of the first comments I heard about the quality of generosity in this context was, of course they would want to make, promote that. They want to make sure we keep pledging. <laughs> the cynical side of me agreed and actually still agrees with that statement. But as a defining value, it's wonderful. It takes us beyond gratitude to a place that we feel that we not only have enough, but enough to share. Transformation is the one value that was changed from the previous draft with the blobs to the current one with the flower. Originally, the value was evolution. And I remember being, Ugh. Evolution is a process of transformation, but it isn't the only one. By embracing transformation as a divining value, we recognize that each of us is changing and becoming something wondrous. Interdependence is a nod to the current seventh principles interdependent web of existence. However, interdependence as a standalone word value reminds us that we all need each other to survive and thrive. I'm less sanguine about justice, equity, and pluralism. Justice as a standalone concept can be harsh unless it's tempered by mercy or kindness. I imagine justice from a core of love would cover that. The definition of justice in section C 2.2 refers back to the dismantling of systemic, systemic, yeah, systemic oppressions from the eighth principle and the use of democratic process from the fifth. I feel that there might be a better word for this. My feelings about equity are similar. I wonder why equity rather than equality. The definition refers to the inherent worth and dignity of the first principle. Does the word equity evoke the first principle for you? Doesn't for me. Pluralism is the word chosen to express our commitment to diversity and multiculturalism. Why not use diversity or multiculturalism as the value? Their meaning is clearer. It also feels to me that something has been left out of the chosen values, ideas that come down to us from our Unitarian side of our heritage, like logic and reason. Of course, thinking about that got me thinking about the logical song by Supertramp. Oh, they sent me away, teach me how to be logical, practical, responsible, sensible. And I had the information. How about responsibility as one of the defining values on the flower? As the definition might be we all have as individuals and congregations and an association a responsible ability to work to bring forward our vision of a better world. Just throwing it out there. Each of us speaking today was limited to seven minutes, so I really don't have time to talk about the addition of color to the six petal glyph of the flower. It's up great. I like it but I'm not entirely sure of the assignment of color to values. Color adds a dimension of meaning that isn't probably worthy of its own seven minute talk or maybe longer. <laughs> all in all, I like the concept of an image like the flower becoming our new statement of belief, but I think there is still work to be done before it's written in stone. If I were a delegate to the GA, which I'm not, I would probably vote to advance the flower, but with the understanding that we would continue to work to refine it over the next year. Please stand as you're willing and able for a will build the land. Number 121 in the gray hymnal. Um, we're only doing the first and fourth verses. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Oh, we're almost done. <laughs> call to action. The call to action this week is to reflect deeply on the Article 2 report. Have deep, beloved conversations with friends about your thoughts. Take time to think of the words that you use to describe Unitarian Universalism. Participate in the town hall on this subject that will be held sometime in May. Or participate either in some online learning or congregational learning that will be offered by UU Wellspring. More details, details will follow on the announcement roll and flash and also in this space. To Make Ready for the Coming Day by Bill Hamilton Holloway. If I were to wish you peace, it would not be for long. It would be peace to rest, to reflect, to make ready for the coming day, that the full force of your creativity and love might be released and shared. I do wish you peace. And now join with me. We release that which was called with love and gratitude, and we extinguish the flame but not our commitment to being a beacon in the desert. This builds rightly into the idea again. Thank you to Maggie for playing the piano this morning. <laughs> uh, Keith and Jeff in the back for managing the AV. And Larry for our beautiful flowers. And thank you everyone for coming either in person or through Zoom. Now please take a moment to ruminate on the service and ground yourself. Next week's service is Transformation from the Inside Out with Reverend Gordon. Please enjoy our coffee hour. Announcements will continue to roll during the friendship break. <laughs>